So I'm a big fan of foldable phones, and I've been watching their evolution from, say, the Mate X3 being the thinnest, lightest foldable out there to this now, which is the most powerful. It is the Vivo X Fold 2. I reviewed the previous model, and there were a few things I didn't like about it. The software was the big one. Well, has it improved now with this model? But before I get into that in the video, let's talk a little bit about its hardware, why it is impressive. Well, it's got the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, UFS 4.0 storage, and 12 gigabytes of RAM. That's the fastest yet, but it doesn't stop just there. It also has 120 watt charging for its 4,800 milliamp hour battery. And the screen, the internal one, well, that's eight inches. It's in fact 8.03 inches and it is a 120 hertz display and it's got ultrasonic fingerprint readers as well. One on the outside and even one in the inside. This model I got from Trading Shenzhen. So it is an import version. There is no global release of the X Fold 2 and I doubt there ever will be. So we've got here what is called their flash charge. Now this is a 120 watts. So it is very quick. I'll give you the exact charging time later on. Type-C to Type-C cable. There is a off-camera SIM tray tool, a bit of paperwork, but that's in Chinese. And we get this nice case for the back of it. So it's the adhesive type that you do need to stick it on. And it has that vegan, well, the fake leather on the back of it and a clear part here and a raised edge for the camera module. The quality of it's really good. So having now handled and tested a little bit the Mate X3 from Huawei, no foldable can match their hardware, the size of it and the thickness, but it's not too bad here with the Vivo. So we are looking at a weight of 279 grams when it's folded like this. The thickness measuring here is 12.9 millimeters. And when it is opened up, it is just six millimeters, the thickness. And that's not too bad, but again, it cannot compete with that Huawei Mate X3. So there are some changes here with this compared to the previous model that we do have a two times optical camera on the rear of it. That's 12 megapixels, 12 megapixel ultra wide, but they did away with the periscopic camera. Main camera is 50 megapixels, it does have optical image stabilization, that particular one, and we've got laser sys focus, which is here, and the flash module. And yes, it is using the Zeiss T-Star coding, which is good, but a bit of a downgrade missing out on that periscopic camera. This back here with the fake leather again does feel really good, and there's this nice little texture inside this clear part here. Vivo branding very clear there too as well. And when you look at the bottom here, we've got our Type-C port and loudspeaker. So it takes two nano SIMs. This is a metal frame here. And unfortunately, this is another weird decision here. I think because of the 120 watt charging, they had to give up on the USB 3.1 port. So we miss out on that fast charging, sorry, the video out for the fast charging, they've made that compromise. And I don't think that's a good idea. And the USB 3.1 was really good to have. Up the top here, there is a microphone, the other loudspeaker, you can see the antenna lines. There's no IR transmitter. We have the spine of it right here. Now, when you open it up, it does have a very nice feel to it. Quite satisfying. And what is even more satisfying for me is this. The ultrasonic fingerprint reader is also in the inner display here. And it's a very good one at that too, this ultrasonic fingerprint reader. I've never had it fail. I mean, I think Vivo has the best when it comes to fingerprint readers. You can see it just tap it lightly and it works. I'll do the same with the outside. I'll tap it really quick this time just to show you how good it is. It's that good. It's probably one of the best. So we have our outer display here, which is a normal width, which is great. So it's not like the Fold 4, the Fold 3, and the 2 from Samsung. And this is here, of course, we're looking at now a smaller screen size. So it's 6.53 inches. It's the 21 by 9 aspect ratio, and it's basically 1080p plus here. This screen, AMOLED, 120 hertz. Both the screens are the inner screen here, this one is 8.03 and it does have a resolution of 1916 by 2160. So 360 uh, is the PPI, the pixel density. And it's a good screen, 120 Hertz, very smooth uh, animations look pretty good, but more on that later on in the video. So just show you that when I turn it off and get it at a certain angle, yes, you can see the crease. You can feel it a little bit. It's looking worse than what it really is. This is so much better than a fold two, three, and four. Uh, very good. Is it as good as, say, maybe the Mate X3? Very similar there, having seen the Mate X3. So the hardware is top notch, but missing out on the periscopic camera. And then the video out on the bottom here in the USB 3.1 is a downgrade 
for this model. Power button here is made out of metal, volume up and down button as well. And we do have here, this is a slider, so you can switch it from the standard mode into silent mode without having to even power on the screen or unlock the phone. So for our selfie cameras, we do have a 16 megapixel right here on the outer screen, and it is the same exact sensor for the inner screen. Now, both of those inner cameras, unfortunately, they're not supporting 4K video, so that's not exactly flagship level, but it's not too much of an issue because you can do this. You can go and flip around into the selfie mode, then hit that, that you turn on the rear selfie. So when you flip it over, you can then use the rear cameras which I'll do later on with this sample that I will give you. So that's how we get it around that. We can use the rear sensors and you can use the two times optical and they can all shoot 4K and even the ultra wide. So that's how you can get past it. And the main camera can also shoot 8K too as well. You can use for selfie footage. More on those screens. So we do have 120 Hertz on the outer screen and the inner screen. So great that they've got that matching refresh rate. And as I showed you before, that fingerprint reader ultrasonic is absolutely fantastic. So maximum brightness with this screen here, their claim is 1600 nits peak. I've not been able to actually see that or measure it, just over about 1200 nits, but you can make it out in direct sunlight. In sunlight, no problems, even with the inner screen too. So this one peaks at 1800 nits. Again, I have not been able to measure that. Maybe I'm not in the right scenario with the sunlight to be able to trigger it, but in direct sunlight, you can make out the screen just fine. It's very clear and it holds that higher brightness, that peak for quite some time before it does start to dim. A lot longer than the Fold 3 or 4 from Samsung. So the refresh rate options we do get just 60 or 120 hertz. Sadly, there is no 90 hertz option. We've got the display size. Now I've been tweaking with this a little bit. I've scaled it down so I can just fit more on the screen to take advantage of having such a large 8.03 inch size screen. But as I pointed out, well, we'll point out, sorry, is that the scanning of the apps uh, doesn't seem to go with that scaling. Like it's not global, it's more for just the launcher settings and not your individual apps, which is a slight annoying. Your font style, screen colors, this is all pretty standard and there you can go along, adjust your white balance. All up, it is a very good panel. Both of the panels, top hardware, really good, nice crease. And I've got pretty much zero complaints about these screens, they are, really top-notch, top-tier panels that Vivo has selected. The X-Fold 3 is running Origin OS based on Android 13. Now you can take advantage of the full screen, of course, and you can multitask, and it's quite good at that. I'll just quickly show you some examples here. So I do have, or did have before, split screen set up. You can simply go and select. So you can run a small window if you wanted to do that. This is my gallery. And that seems to be pretty good. So I can make it a large screen, of course. I can go along and then set that, okay, I want this to be split screen and it'll move it to one side and then run and bring open Play Store. Yes, Play Store support is there. You just simply need to install it and then you've got it. What I have noticed is in split screen, the app performance seems to be a little bit reduced. Now that scrolling does not seem to be 120 uh, frames per second, 120 hertz, even though I've forced that for both the inner and outer screens. Then of course you can resize that, that's all possible. And there are other options that I'll get into that you can uh, optimize a little bit more for such a foldable device. Now what you're running on this side of the screen, uh, you're always going to have to when you fold it up. You see that there it is now that I had before. Okay, so that's right there. But when you open it, you've got the same again on the inner screen. So that does make it pretty comfortable when you're using it and everything. But what I have to complain about is just some of the animations. Um, they're not, I don't think, optimized good enough, especially for this kind of power we've got here. The other is this, that Twitter seems to be the performance a little poor, and yes, it could be down to the APK file, it could be down to this version of the app, but I've just noticed that in general, uh, the performance doesn't seem to be the scrolling as good as it could be. It feels a little bit janky, just like the animation sometimes that when you go to bring up another app or you go to minimize, I've noticed it feel a little bit choppy and other times it's being very fluid and smooth. The other is the app scaling too. App scaling seems to be very large here for Twitter. Now you can set in the display settings as I showed you before, you're scaling, you can size things down, but it is really, I think just too large. I don't know why it's not scaling that properly. So some of the apps have DPI scaling issues. The other is the animations. And overall, yes, it's great for multitasking, running them side by side, those apps with the split screen. 
that's good. I just feel more optimization clearly needed. It's nowhere near at that level that we have with Samsung's One UI with their foldable devices just seems way, way more polished than what we have here with Origin OS. As you can see now with YouTube, so I can have the comments here on the bottom, type on those where I've got up on the top here, my video playing. So it's a bit of a flex mode when you open that right up, it will then change the scaling. So it is working. Is it as good as Samsung's flex mode with the fold that I have used before? Very, very similar, about the same. And yes, the hinge seems to be fine. It won't automatically spring right open. It's just that last little bit that you feel the hinge doing that where it springs right open. And it does have a very satisfying noise that it makes and quality feel to it, the hinge. It feels really solid. Then Vivo has this for foldable device settings. Okay, you've got multi-window for apps, the display ratio. So I have messed about with this, especially with Twitter, trying to correct the scaling on it. And you can have the borders either side and have it set to like 21 by nine scaling. It just looks ugly and it's not taking up full advantage of the screen. So everything seems to scale pretty good. It's just certain apps there. And we do have other options. So the smart secondary screen display, global taskbar there. There are a few options in here and flex mode. Yes, there is a flex mode. You can enable that with certain applications. Now bloatware is something I always mention in all of my reviews. Yes, there is a lot of it. And I mean a lot of all these Chinese things. But the good news is that Vivo, unlike many other brands, lets us remove pretty much 99% of everything can be uninstalled. So you need to spend about 10 minutes uninstalling the stuff that's valid for Chinese mainland users that aren't for us. You can get rid of all of that, which is good. Firmware updates. So I've had one already, which was quite a big update, fixing some system bugs, issues, optimizing the fingerprint reader. Not that I ever had any problems with it on the earlier firmware. And this is what you're left with after you uninstall all that bloatware. So, well, and to, to I installed that DRM info, um, a few other things here, but there's basically no bloat whatsoever. So very good that we can do that. Now the performance of the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, fantastic. This is a big step up from the Gen 1. Well worth it. And that's why I do say that this is the fastest foldable at the time of this video that is out now. Stunning performance, really quick in everything apart from, yes, yeah, some of those UI animations. So the internal storage, this is UFS 4.0. Blazing fast here, really good speeds, as fast as most people's uh, notebooks, ultrabooks. And this really did surprise me. I was not expecting this at all. So it doesn't scale down at all. It doesn't really throttle. Only about 6.6% performance loss after 20 minutes of a super demanding stress test. This is 3D Mark's Wildlife Extreme test. And this is pushing the graphics really hard. Most phones cannot even achieve this. Even the slab style phones won't be able to do this. So that's why I was surprised with the foldable that did so well. So excellent cooling. Yes, it gets a little hot, but just really good solid performance. You can see it did reach 50 degrees C. This is on the battery, I believe that temperature sensor and uh, not the chipset itself. So yes, when you touch the outside of it, you feel that, wow, that's getting really quite hot but they push that performance to the absolute max. Now the safety net. So if you're looking at banking applications, we do have NFC on board and it passes this test. So GPay, Google Pay, uh, that is all going to be working on it, which is another bonus. And we do have maximum camera to API support here of level three for all of the cameras that it does have. So if you wanted a different style of camera quality, both photo quality, then check out open camera, Gcam ports perhaps. And yes, widevine level one cert. So that means Netflix is in full HD, Amazon Prime Video 2. This is from within Netflix, I tested that out. So we get full HD, but it's not listing the screen as being HDR compliant, which is a little odd because it is an HDR 10 plus and even a Dolby Vision screen too. Uh, but no, we don't get that for some reason until Netflix uh, acknowledges that yes, it does support it. Now battery life, take this with a pinch of grain of salt here because um, this is a fixed test, all right? So eight hours and 38 minutes is a very good result. Now the battery life is somewhere around that of the Fold 4 that I've also tested out before. So you're looking real world use of around about seven hours, seven and a half max, which for a foldable is actually very good. It's a top score. Now the battery capacity is 4,800 milliamp hours. And of course we've got that 120 watt wire charging. 
It took just 34 minutes, my little scribble here, because it, it failed to, to do the test properly because it uh, restarted around the 97 mark. But that is, again, that's fantastic. So it's the fastest charging foldable there is out there at the moment too because, well, their claim is 26 minutes, but I've never been able to achieve that. Maybe there's something in the settings hidden away that I need to enable. 34 is still excellent, and we have 50 watt wireless charging as well. So fantastic charge times, really good battery life, and just amazing performance are the big pros out of this model. Now I know a lot of people will be asking this, so 5G connectivity, yes, no problems with me here in Spain, I'm on my 5G bands and I'm getting similar speeds to what I can get out of my Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. They are very slow, it's almost like fake 5G here because it's still using the 4G network infrastructure and the speeds are exactly the same really from what I can get with 4G. So LTE, LTE band 20 working for me, 5G all working, and I do believe it has a global modem on it. So most people should not have any problems at all getting on 5G and getting on 4G data with fast, normal kind of speeds. Onto our sound now, so we have loudspeakers that are at the top here with me using it now in landscape. So if you are gaming, you don't block those speakers. I do find the speakers to be pretty good actually for such a thin device. When open like this, it's six millimeters the thickness. So you don't have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, so you have to get yourself one of those, of course. Problem solved and the quality, good. I wouldn't rate it as the absolute best that I've heard, but I do find that the stereo separation is good, the loudness, and everything seems to be just fine with it. A voice calls as well, no issues. So what I'll do is I will play a track right here in YouTube at 100% volume, just to give you an idea that these are quite punchy, reasonably good speakers for a foldable. Now gaming performance is very good here with the X-Fold 2. I don't really notice any lag. This is the top settings for Genshin Impact, 30 frames per second, everything just maxed out. And it is really good. So it's constant performance. Now I do have enabled here what is the boost mode. So you can set that. I just swipe here, got it in the boost mode and that does boost up the performance as the name uh, does suggest there. But the trade-off is the thermals. It does get quite hot, but you get that constant performance now just where the camera module is on the back is where you will feel that heat. So just around here, I've noticed it gets a little bit hot, especially around the frame and very warm to the touch, about 50 to 51 degrees. So that is the trade-off of pushing such excellent performance here, Vivo, is that yes, it will get quite warm when you're holding it and when you're gaming, but you just gain steady, constant, really good performance, even from the most demanding games here. Over to our cameras now. So I'm using the main 50 megapixel camera. I've swapped the screen around and you can use it this way to get much better improved quality. I can also tap and then move over to the ultra wide now and you can see I get a lot more in the shot and this just it really does improve the quality here. And it's easy enough to frame using the outer screen when you're using this for vlog footage. So we can shoot 4K 30, 4K 60, 8K 30 frames per second, the audio bit rate isn't very good, it's only 128 kilobits per second. And I think it sounds a little bit scratchy. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. So just like I did before, I can apply the zoom to go back over to the ultra wide camera. And then I'll go to two times. That is now two times digital. And it looks all right. I wouldn't go over that because it starts to look a little bit pixelated. So the electronic image stabilization seems to work well. That's the ultra wide again. And when I pan around, not really seeing any judder coming through. Then our camera. So this is a selfie with the main rear camera. So I just flipped it around. Pretty good quality. Overall, I'm quite pleased with the cameras. This selfie is the outer. So that's a 16 megapixel without the portrait mode. This is now the portrait, 50 megapixels. Reasonably good shot, but I had trouble with the stitching a little bit. The shot here of my cat Vera. Looks great, but a little bit oversaturated. The colors are slightly off, but this one here of these flowers, it looks pretty good. I do like the bokeh, the background blur there. Ultra wide shot. Again, a little bit oversaturated. The colors may be a little bit off here. Low light is the weakness of these cameras, so they do take reasonably good photos, but just not as good as, for example, the X90 Pro Plus or their other phones from Vivo 
the shot here, the sky looks to be a little bit off again, the colors. So some optimization is needed with the cameras. All up, this is a phone that's got a lot going for it, hardware-wise. Like that fingerprint reader, both the inner and outer, absolutely fantastic. We have that alert slider switch so you can go from silent into your normal general sound mode there without even having to turn it on. So it's like what the iPhones have, that little switch. It's nice and handy. OnePlus phones too as well. And the hinge feels really, really good. Great inner screen, outer screen, no complaints with them at all. They're bright, 120 hertz and the back of it feels great. Now there's some weird decisions here. They dropped the periscopic camera. They decided not to use USB 3.1 with video out and the high transfer speeds, it's USB 2 only, ouch. The audio bit rate for video should be better. And for me, the big one is the software. It's just not that well optimized compared to Samsung's foldables. And you do notice that once you use Samsung's, you move, move over to this phone, it's just lacking the optimization, the scanning of some of the apps, side-by-side -side app performance doesn't seem quite as good, even though this is so much faster than a Z Fold 4. So I would wait and see, what is Samsung going to release with the Galaxy Z Fold 5 and also the Xiaomi Mix 3 when that does come out, maybe wait and see what's gonna happen there. I wanna absolutely love the 120 watt fast charging on this and the 50 watt fast charging, but was it a big enough thing to give up the fast USB 3.1 port? I don't think it is. I would have rather have had slower charging and the video out and the USB 3.1. So thank you so much for watching my review of the Vivo X Fold 2.